Good evening, my name is Alicia Arter, and tonight I'm giving a presentation on Queen Anne's Historic Grocery Stores. It is a compilation of articles that I researched and wrote with Jan Hadley, a Queen Anne Historical Society board member. Uh, several years ago, uh, we spent a long time at Queen Anne News and at the Paul Allen Library researching these grocery stores, and we were surprised to find out that between 1910 and the 1930s, there were 20 to 60 grocery stores at any time on Queen Anne Hill. They popped up along trolley lines because automobiles were not commonplace at that time. The stores had walk-in customers, but they also needed the trolley to get more customers. It also made it easier for their customers to get home with the heavy packages of groceries that they had purchased. Today we have, after that large number, we just have three grocery stores on Queen Anne and we're waiting for Safeway to get finished so that we don't have a fourth one. Many of the grocery stores, um, sites can, are still in existence. Here's Sixth Avenue West with Targi's Tavern which you see over here. Um, however, early in the 1900s, that, that target spot was De Bruyler's grocery store. The, actually the grandson from De Bruyler's was a Queen Anne High School grad and he is still around. He, is, uh, he owns Accutent in Bellevue and with him at Accutent is his buddy from Queen Anne High School, Alden Gray, Grayboard. Grebner. Alden was actually a grocery boy, delivery boy for Standard Grocery where Queen Anne Dispatch is now. You can see it's kind of still a small world. Take a look inside Queen Anne Dispatch the next time you're there and you will see the signs of an old grocery store. Beautiful old wood floors and doors and even the layout reminds you of a grocery store. The five spot on Queen Anne was a Safeway in the 1930s. This black and white photo in 1937 um, shows that building as a Safeway before Safeway became even a big chain. Top Pot Donuts is another spot which used to be an old grocery store started out as a red and white grocery and the final grocery that was in there was Nelson's grocery run by Don Nelson until the year 2001. It had started 86 years previously. Here's a picture of Don looking out of the grocery store as he did many times a day. Um, interestingly enough, that the Nelson grocery was started by his, fa his father and his father's sister, Don's aunt, and it ran for 82 years and it's, and started out over in this building at 4th Avenue North. <clears throat> the space that it was in is now Caraba Violins and it was a fairly large space. And it also incorporated Nelson's very own ice cream parlor they also carried home-baked goods, French pastries, and school supplies and tobacco. Even though it was right on the Gaylor streetcar line, it still offered home delivery, which was just an extra plus for everybody concerned. Around 1943, the Nelsons decided to move into the top spot location. According to Carol Nagy, who was Don's friend, and also owned soft coverings store next door to this building. The corner location, you know, just provided better exposure for the um, for the grocer. 
John's niece, Carol Oversee Johnson, recalled, my early memories of Nelson's were of the barrels of nuts and other staples and the bulk cookies sold from corrugated cartons that had glass doors on the front. There were just a few ice cream treats in a small carnation company freezer. Spices were stored in heavy pressed glass jars and were sold in bulk. For the benefit of the carriage trade, the store carried some exotic ingredients such as pickled walnuts and various dried fruits. The store smelled of ground coffee, spices, and smoked meats, an odor that still faintly ling lingered at the time the business closed. I had told my Uncle Don that if I were blindfolded and brought into the store, I would know exactly where I was. One special memory I have when my grandfather was still there was picking up the receiver, listening for the operator saying, number please, and then reciting the, the telephone number, Garfield 0011, and hearing my grandpa Nelson answer to take our grocery order. The new Nelson store at the top pot site carried fresh vegetables, fruit, meat, spices, baking supplies, Pepsi-Cola, gays bread, cereals, packaged foods, and more. Local kids came in for the large candy counter at the front of the store. It was behind the cash register stand and it held hundreds of classic candy bars like Snickers, Milky Way, Hershey's, and all, as well as more unusual bars and a wide variety of chewing gum, snacks, and baseball cards. The store also carried some foods from the old country, such as lingonberry jam and fish specialties from Norway. Nelson's Grocery had a secret room that made it very unique. It's because before, even before it was a grocery, it was an old silent movie house. The secret room was lined in tin and it was the projection room. Don Nelson talked about this room, describing it as part of a silent movie theater in the building. The room's window is still visible near the roof line of the building on 4th Avenue uh, West Side. The tin rooms were required to minimize the fire hazards of old arc lamp movie projectors. In, nine, in 2016, I went into Hot Pot Donuts and asked if that room was still there. They were surprised, but they said yes, and they had never seen the inside of it because the door was locked, and they has always wondered what that secret place was. Don took over the grocery store after his aunt Elizabeth retired. He ran it with his brother Fred until Fred retired in 1995. Don was a familiar figure in the neighborhood, known for his dry sense of humor as he made friends with his customers, offering advice and acting as a source for neighborhood news. He had a comical holiday newsletter, which advertised wonderful holiday gifts like gummy roaches, Wrigley's Cheeto flavored gum, and it reminded customers to please give him only gifts that he could resell to help his bottom line. And he pleaded, please no more banana bread. He was known for his kindness and he carried customers. In other words, they could buy things, but he didn't make them pay. People who couldn't afford to pay for groceries. And he offered store accounts until the closed store in two. The store closed in 2001. It was really unusual for that time. In the 1970s, Don was shot and injured during an armed robbery of the store, and he told friends that after recovering, he almost didn't open the store up again. He loved cars and in his youth had a reputation for being both handsome and part of the social scene. He had a longtime girlfriend for 25 years, but never married because he felt the grocery store profits couldn't financially support a family and a wife. In his spare time, he collected coins and stamps. He enjoyed railroad history, and he really loved visiting his cabin on Hood Canal. Don Nelson died in 2006, just five years after he closed the store. Where Dick's Drive-In now stands, the Motor Inn Market opened October 17, 1930, to much fanfare at 500 Queen Anne Avenue North. It was an innovative market and the first of its kind in the Queen Anne neighborhood. It focused on people who would come grocery shopping in automobiles. And now, finally, that was a new concept for the times. You can see this tall corner tower. It lit up at night to ensure people could find the location in their automobiles. And this L-shaped parking lot had enough 
space for 100 cars. It also included a shell filling station on site. Attendants would park your car for you. Here's a picture with the filling station and you can see the tall tower and the, the small individual stores that made up this early shopping mall. While you were shopping, you could also have your groceries delivered to your car and a special numbering system ensured that the right packages were delivered to the correct cars. You could also phone your grocery order in, have it filled ahead of time and then delivered to the car when you drove into the parking lot. I'm still doing that with Safeway where I live. One of the reasons for this was in 1930, the shopping cart had yet to be invented. So most groceries were contained in handheld baskets, which got really heavy as items were added. Many people stopped shopping when their baskets became too heavy. And so the motor in system with the car delivery could mean higher sales for the stores. It was based on a model from California and the enthusiasm for automobiles gripped the country even while the Great Depression began taking its toll. At its inception, an additional 19 similar markets were envisioned for Seattle, but most of those markets were not built, probably due to the, the depression. Although locally, the Cove Mid-City Market, which was Builders Hardware at 15th Avenue West and the Magnolia Bridge, was built by a different developer. Builders Hardware has since moved to Kent and the, the old Cove Mid-City Market is still waiting for its next renter. The land on which the Motor Inn Market was built was described as the site of pioneer David Denny. You can see that in the annotation at the bottom of this photograph in the 1937 King County tax photo. There is some dispute about whether the house was here or across the street, and I don't know the answer to that. The developers selected stores at the Motor Inn Market to be pleasing to the customers as well as compatible with each other. The Motor Inn Market claimed to have the quiet, highest quality products sold at the lowest prices possible, and care was taken to have the latest innovations in the market. Their bakery had an electric oven, which was a sensation at the time, and a Hobart brand mixer. Very cool. Modern conveniences were highlighted as well as a sanitary quote unquote, shopping experience. The first occupants advertised were pay and, and you can see them in the ad here, were pay and save food stores, the G&B steak shop, Fisher's Bakery and Delicatessen, Geo Guy Drugs, and Shell Gasoline. They offered producers dairy. How were the prices? An ad in the Queen Anne News for Thanksgiving 1930 listed eggs for 29 cents a pound, Del Monte coffee for 33 cents a pound. A whole pie was 30 or 40 cents. The building and parking lot stretched out 200 feet along Queen Anne Avenue North and 120 feet along Republican Street. The exterior was light colored with a Spanish style roof. As time went by, the building continued to house various grocery doors and shops. By 1958, the, only one side of the L-shaped building appears to have remained. This is the only photo that we could find and when we, we, courtesy of Paul Dorpat, and it housed the Dymomatic self-serve laundromat with parking. There were two other food-related businesses close by, Smith's Bakery and Freeze Incorporated, listed in the Polk's business directory that year. Wasn't expecting that. You can see the final year of operation was 1974 and the laundromat operating alongside Wally's Drive-In and the Snow White Bakery. That year, the building was demolished and subsequently replaced with the current Stick Dick's Drive-In. When I look at Dick's Drive-In, I look at that great big parking lot and in my mind's eye, I can still see the motor in market because that was unusual to have that much um, 
space for parking, you know, 100 cars, that's a lot. Elsewhere, on the top of Queen Anne, Frank Wolgamuth owned grocery stores from 1918 to 1966. Wolgamuth's East Queen Anne Grocery started in 1918, was located at 1716 2nd Avenue North, which was All Saints Church until recently and is now becoming Wim with Him Dance Studio. Here's a photo of the East Queen Anne Grocery and it began in 1918 operating until 1966 when, and that's when Frank Wolgamuth retired. In 2016, I was able to talk to Frank's daughter, Joan Wolgamuth, who is also a Queen Anne High School graduate. And she recalled the store from her parents' stories. The Wolgamuth family lived upstairs, up here, which is very convenient um, because you know you, you were putting in very long hours at a grocery store. Joan's window was in, out in the front so she could see the comings and goings on the street outside. By leaning out a second story window, she and her brother could pick ripe cherries from the tree next to the grocery store. Fittingly, that tree had been started from a cherry pit, according to Joan. A neighborhood grocer's day was a long one and her father left early each morning, traveling to a grocery wholesaler downtown near the federal building so he could buy fresh fruits and vegetables for his store. Since this meant a very early rising, when he also had to help in the stores, selling things and packing and unpacking, he would sneak upstairs to their home at lunchtime after a meal, sometimes followed by a quick nap. The family was proud to own a Huckmobile automobile, and when business was really good, they also had a delivery truck. Customers' orders would come in over the phone during the day, and each customer had a book with their name on it in which the order was recorded. The orders were filled, put in wooden boxes, and then delivered. Customers who shopped in person usually came on the trolley, which stopped right in front of the store. Joan recalls very few cars coming by uh, to, to shop at the store. Joan and her brother, Bruce, also a Queen Anne High School grad, 1947, both worked in the family store. During World War II, one of Joan's tasks was to wa walk the completed ration stamp books to the OPA, the Office of Price Administration, on the hill on Queen Anne. Her brother cleaned the store after closing. To clean the stores, he would moisten carrot tops and toss them on the ground. When they were swept up, the carrot fronds did a quick job of collecting the day's dirt and dust. The store had plenty of temptations for young children. When Joan was young, there was a glass case in front, which was full of candy. She practiced opening it very slowly so that her father wouldn't hear her, and then would silently grab a Hershey's Kiss to eat. She thought she was getting away with it until one day she looked up and saw her father watching her. She remembered him saying, you know, your brother asks me first before he takes it. Those candy cases were eventually replaced by a freezer case for ice cream and frozen vegetables. Before that, the vegetables were kept fresh with ice chipped off the big, large blocks of ice that were used in the store for cooling. The old neighborhood grocery stores each had a unique mix of brands. Wolgamuth's carried Arden Milk, Gold Metal was their brand of flour, and canned goods were from Surefine. They didn't carry liquor or beer because, and next door there was a meat market in an older building, which still had its false front facade. When the store finally closed, the church brought the property and the current building was erected in 1967, according to King County tax records. One of the most popular places on vintage Queen Anne was the Van de Camp's Bakery, which had a large windmill on top of the building and advertised, as you can see in the picture, 17 kinds of coffee cakes. Who wouldn't like that? Queen Anne Hill welcomed Van de Camp's Holland Dutch Bakery chain in 1929. The Los Angeles-based company was founded in California by Theodore Van de Camp in 1915 as a potato chip store but it eventually branched out into bakeries and they operated in California and Washington. The Van de Camp's bakeries on Queen Anne were located at Queen Anne Avenue and, and Mercer where Pagliacci Pizza was until July, 2020. And there's now a taqueria. At the top of the hill, there was also a Van de Camp's 
2127, which is where all the best uh, pet care is now. Yeah. I mean, it's funny to think about that. It used to be a Vandy Camps bakery. Vandy Camps' first grand opening on Queen Anne was at the Mercer and Queen Anne Avenue location on August 27th, 1929. The rotating Delft blue windmills on the top of the bakery added to the fun of shopping there, especially if you were a kid, as did the Dutch costumes and uniforms and traditional peaked hats worn, worn by the staff. Here we can see one of the staff handing a cake to a uh, TV announcer. Theodore van de Kamp chose the Dutch theme as a symbol of cleanliness and of European quality. And it worked. They became very, very popular. My grandmother used to take me there. I used to get a free cookie. The tall windmill was easily seen by passing cars, of course. And as it was an easily recognized symbol, and it was designed by a man named Harry Oliver, who was a Hollywood movie studio artist, who was the set designer for the movie Ben-Hur in 1925 and many other movies. Inside the bakeries, they were also decorated in Dutch style using bright Delft blue and white colors with red tile on the floors. With Van de Kamp's marketing was always important, although the baked goods were really good too. The Queen Anne bakeries were known for their fresh breads, donuts, fancy cakes, pastries, pies, and cookies. Cakes came in chocolate, caramel, prune, angel food, and more. And the donuts were offered in both plain and sugared at 19 cents a dozen in 1931. They used local butter and eggs, and the baking plant was over at Yale Avenue North, currently the Yale building at Fred Hutch Cancer Research. Everything was made there in small quantities, similar to the size of the small patches, batches made at home by home bakers. And this was said to ensure the fine texture and consistent results. The modern electric ovens, a popular feature at this time, were quote unquote scientifically adjusted and all the ingredients were subjected to what they called rigid laboratory tests, according to a 1929 Seattle Times article. For the home baker and non baker alike, the bakeries were pleasant additions to the Hill shopping experience, as they also offered pies such as apricot, holiday pumpkin, brandied mincemeat, and boxes of chocolates. Their popular tray o mints was sold as a box of six mints for nine cents each. To ensure freshness, two delivery drivers, let's see, do I have another picture? Yeah, uh, two delivery drivers, two to three deliveries were made daily from the baking plant to the retail bakeries. At the end of each day, the retail bakeries cleared their shelves, sending all the leftover pastries to a day old store. The next, the day after that, the unsold two-day-old pastries were donated to local charities. Bandy Camps eventually transformed the business into packaged goods sold in grocery stores. It ceased operations in 1985. The Vandy Camps frozen fish products that you can still find in grocery stores are an offshoot of the business. Now we come to one of the most popular grocers on Queen Anne Hill, Charlie Broad. This is a picture of his first store. It's on, it's on Gaylor Street, um, very close to Queen Anne Avenue. You can kind of see the slant of the street um, and recognize it as Gaylor close to Queen Anne Avenue. He started in the grocery business in 1909 and he didn't retire until 53 years later in 1962 when he was 84 years old. He was an old fashioned, nice guy. He had a very straightforward personality, told lots of jokes. And according to his delivery boy, Alden Grebner, um, everybody liked him. Grebner still recalls the delivery truck, which was a black panel van circa 1940. Charlie Broad was described by longtime local residents and Queen Anne Historical Society member Paul Mooney as the father confessor for all the housewives on Queen Anne Hill. 
During the Great Depression, he was respected in the neighborhood for selling groceries on credit to families who would never be able to afford to pay their bill. Mooney recalled in the 1982 Queen Anne Historical Society Oral History Project that Broad was, quote, telling about the amounts that he was carrying on credit during the Depression. Broad's, Charlie Broad said, of course, the suppliers are carrying me. They don't make me pay for it. There was nothing else they could do. People have to eat. What a refreshing take um, on people that are have fallen upon hard times. Charlie Broad was born October 12th, 1878 in Kansas City, Kansas to German Jewish immigrants. And he came to Seattle to visit the Alaska Yukon Exposition in 1909 and right away got a job at a high-end grocer, Augustine and Kyer, just up the street from this picture on, on two days later. He was, he was the produce manager of the Queen Anne Augustine and Kyer store by 1911. That Augustine and Kyer store, of course, is now um, a restaurant on Queen Anne Avenue. And it's, and it, you know, it's still there. <clears throat> About 1918, he went into business for himself at 15 West Gaylor, and that's this picture. And it's called a Little Queen Anne Grocery, also known as Broad and Baker, colloquially. Property is currently Gale and Terrace Apartments. We got this picture at Queen Anne Historical because someone in Hawaii was going through their family's treasures and came upon this picture, knew that it was from Queen Anne Hill and sent it to us saying, I don't know where this is. I just know that it was there. It says Queen Anne Hill right on the um, front there. It's up to you guys to find out. Charlie sh shown with his business partner, Shirley Bertrand Baker, and their grocery boasted regular groceries, baked goods, delicatessen food, lunch served, and cigars, all in that small space. Charlie Broad lived in an apartment right next door at 23 West Gaylor that is currently the Queen Anne Court, which is still the same building. He lived there for 50 years. While in business on Gaylor Street, he and his business partner also operated a grocery actually inside a house in 1914 at 1717 First Avenue North. In 1925, things changed and he began operations at Standard Grocery on Queen Anne Avenue, currently Queen Anne Dispatch. It was a classic old fashioned market until the day it closed. With its own house credit, Broad tracked the customer accounts with a vintage McCaskey file system. Business was conducted over the main counter, and according to the Seattle Times, the convivial store smelled of bananas, spices, and sweeping compound. It served both the hard-pressed of Queen Anne and the well-off on the hill. Charlie Broad ran that grocery until 1962, and his clientele included generations of regulars from all over the hill. Groceries ordered by phone were collected in numbered wooden boxes to be sent out for delivery. When asked if he ever thought of modernizing, he told John Redden of the Seattle Times that he had entertained that idea, but his customers insisted that he not do it because, quote, they didn't come to standard grocery for fancy service. In 1962, his store, whose space he rented for years, was sold, and he decided to close the business. He passed away in 1965, just three years after he retired. And that is a picture of the standard grocery as it looked at the time. And, you know, you can certainly see Queen Anne dispatch shining through there. Um, I think it's amazing that, you know, we can still see these things. That, that's the end of the lecture for tonight. I thank you very much. And now I'm going to stop the screen share and we will pause for questions. <laughs>